Hey everyone, we're so glad that you're here with us today. It's going to be a great day as we continue to walk through the book of Psalms this year. Um, we kick off a, a new series where we're going to look at what it means to worship our King. And it's going to be really good. And our pastor, Matt Craig, has a great message for us today. And I just encourage you to stick around and be a part of all um, that God has for us today. Um, I want to encourage you to take a moment and write a comment in the chat. We would love to connect with you. Uh, that is truly our heart, is to connect with you in whatever season of life you may be in. And so we look forward to doing that. Leave a comment. And then just as always, a reminder, if you need information about anything, you can always go to our website at scottsburg.church. Um, there you're going to find all kinds of good stuff that you can be a part of. There's an online connect card right there on the homepage. If you fill that out, let us know who you are and what's going on. We'd love to be right there with you. Um, here in just a moment, we are going to worship together. And I encourage you to take this time uh, to let these words soak into your heart. Listen to what they mean and open up your heart to what God has for you today. Let's worship our King together now. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. With all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all that I have, I will sing. Let everything that has breath 
praise the Lord. And there is a river that flows unrestrained from your heart. Canyons of mercy so deep I could never depart. Father, your wonders are endless. Open my eyes to believe. Awake my soul. Let everything that has been praise the Lord. Let everything that has been praise the Lord. Praise the Lord with all of has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Morning by morning your faithfulness shines like the sun. Heaven's on fire and life with the brilliance of love. Father, your wonders are endless. Open my eyes to believe. Awake my soul. Let everything that has been praise the Lord. Let everything. That has been praise the Lord, praise the Lord with all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all that I, I will sing with everything that has been. Hey everybody, 
Welcome to First Christian Church Online. I'm Lead Pastor Matthew Craig, and I'm glad that you've joined us today. Man, I'm super pumped for today. Uh, we're starting a new series called Worship the King. And over the next several weeks, uh, we're going to take a look at just how great God is. We're going to be looking at some psalms that point towards God's greatness, and we're going to be looking at some ideas that uh, we need to know about and learn about uh, when it comes to being truly blessed. Remember, we started this year off um, by looking at Psalm 1 and how truly blessed we are. Um, and I'll be honest, there have been times when I've missed out on what God, God wanted to give me and, and reward me with uh, because I was so focused, um, just truthfully, on myself, um, on the things that were going on in my own life, my own desires. At times, I was drawn into temptations like we all are. The Bible says that we're going to be uh, drawn into those temptations, but they're not going to overcome us. But, but you know, when, when we miss the mark, when we sin, um, maybe it's because we wanted a quick fix. Maybe we're stressed out and we're full of anxiety. Maybe we just wanted that thing, whatever it was, for that moment, and we just lost sight of God. I think we can all at least understand that feeling. I hope that we move past that as we grow and mature. But there's something in Scripture specifically that can help us lean in close to God. There's something in Scripture that, that can help us understand what God wants for us today and for our future. And, and that is the idea that we've been chasing this whole year is of living this blessed life. I'll, I'll remind you, uh, Psalm 1, excuse me, Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They, those people, are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. That bearing fruit, that's, that's basically God's blessing. That's being a part of the kingdom and, and taking part in what God's doing and then God rewarding. It says their leaves, here's the reward, their leaves will never wither and they will prosper in all they do. I love this idea about living the blessed life. I want to truly live this blessed life. And so before we get going any further, I want you to just for a moment to pause and watch this video. Take a look at this. Listen to these words, and then we'll come back and jump into the scripture. Take a look at this. I've been wrestling with purpose. What was I created for? I'm more than what you see on the surface. See beneath my skin and scars. I'm skinned and scarred marred and twisted, scarred by the past I need to be lifted, and sometimes I question my own existence. What was I put here for? In my seams, it seems that there seems to be more. It's like I'm a light, unplugged from the socket. I mean, do I really exist to put money in my pocket? This nine to five feels like a nine to nine. My mind entwined, I pass the time, life circles me as I wait. What is my estate? I feel like I was made for something great, and yet I can't quite put my finger on it. But when I look at my fingers and I see their design, I realize I'm one of a kind, and something created me. No, someone created me, and that someone made me for a reason. Even though it's clear the past years have been treason, I still sense this drawing, this calling, that even in the midst of my falling, there was someone who died to pick me up, someone who rose to fix me up, someone who's coming back to lift me up. And that someone is Jesus. See, God made me for a purpose. And when I delight in Him, it's brought to the surface. I love the last line of that video. It says, I was made for a purpose. When I delight in him, it's brought to the surface. Think about that. When I delight in God, when I pursue him, when I, 
When I give him my everything, God's plan for me, God's blessing, all of what God wants for me is brought to the surface, but only when I lean in close to him and delight in him and seek him. Um, that's the idea that we're going to be taking a look at today. Um, when you and I come to the place um, that we, how should I say it? When we fully trust God, there's this safe place. There's this um, attitude. Some people call it a worldview. There's this mindset that takes over that places God at the center of everything. All of our decisions, <clears throat> all of what we go through in sadness and pain, um, no matter what happens, no matter what circumstances we go through, God is at the center of it all. And God being at the center of it, the more we understand who he is, the more we understand about his promises, the more we understand that, that no matter what, God is good and that God is working all things out. There's something that takes over in our minds and our hearts that helps us move beyond our own desires, and, and it moves us to this place of, as the psalmist writes, that we're going to see here in a little bit, in Psalm 104, he starts off with this idea of praising God. He says, I praise God. Um, it, it just is amazing. Look, look at this. If you have your Bibles, um, turn them to Psalm 104, and he says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. O Lord my God, how great you are. You're robed with honor and majesty. The psalmist begins just by saying he's come to this place in his life where he knows God is great. I, I hope we can all get there. I hope that this idea of how great God is just begins to overflow in our lives. And then, then how does it manifest itself? How does it come out? Well, the biblical word, the Bible word for that is worship. It overflows out of us into worship and praise to God and to Jesus. Um, Jesus breaks down barriers. Um, Jesus opens his arms to everyone, um, no matter their past, no matter their circumstances. Um, Jesus tears down the walls in my life. He, he breaks them. He, he breaks the walls that separate us as people. And the more we learn about Jesus, the more we learn about who God is, the more that we learn about the Holy Spirit, the more we learn we can't help but come to this place that the psalmist comes to and prays. There's another story that you might find interesting. It's found in Luke chapter 17. And in Luke chapter 17, verses 9, 11 through 19, um, there are 10 men with leprosy, and they're standing outside of the city and the Bible says Jesus continued on towards um, Jerusalem, and he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. Now, Galilee was, obvi Galilee was obviously the, the, the Jewish settlement. Samaria was the settlement of the, of the Samaritans. They were not seen as um, people who most Jews would, would look up. Matter of fact, they were outcasts. Um, they were basically foreigners. And uh, so you have Jesus standing in the border between Galilee, Jerusalem, and, and G Jewish, 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 and then outcast, 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 Samaria. And it says that he entered a village there on the border, and ten men stood at a distance with leprosy. They cried out, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them, and he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And the Bible goes on, and as they were leaving, um, Jesus doesn't do anything else to them. He just says, go show yourselves to the priests. And they turn, and, and they're headed back to the priests, and they're healed along the way. And the Bible says that one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. And in verse 19, he said, it fell, he fell to the ground. The one who had been healed fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. The Bible makes it clear to point out this man was a Samaritan. The one guy who probably shouldn't have been thanking God because he was a Samaritan and the Jewish people treated him um, more than likely very bad. 
the one guy who was on, on the outcast, on, on the outskirts, the one who society said wasn't worth anything, was one who came back. And Jesus, matter of fact, says, didn't I heal 10 men? Weren't there 10 of you? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give God glory except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. There's something that really cool happens when we realize just how much God's taken from us. We can't help but to praise God to shout for praise, to give God glory, to give him the thanks, to remember, man, he brought me out of that. When I delight in Jesus, when I pursue him, when I give him control of my future, when I give him control of today, when I know my blessings come from him, my joy comes from him, my eternity comes from him, it brings me to this place of worship. I can't help in that moment give everything to him, sacrifice for the kingdom. I can't help but love people like he did. I can't help but to hate evil. I can't help to just do everything in me to bring people out of evil. I don't see people, I try not to, when, when I think about all that Jesus has done for me and all that Jesus has done for the world and what he's calling us to do as a church and as, a, as, as individuals, I can't help but hate evil. I hate what evil does to people. I hate what evil does to families. I don't want that. Jesus doesn't want that. So what do I do? How do I go on and continue to live this, this blessed life? When I realize just how much God has done for me, the question is, when I realize that, will I do everything in my power to continue to give back to the people around me, continue to put my faith into action? Or will I just kind of sit back, put it on cruise, and wait for him to come again? You see, when I give it all to him, the Bible makes it very clear that he rewards me with everything. Let's look at that just a little bit deeper. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It is impossible to please God without faith. Okay, I get it. I have to have faith to please God. Okay, makes sense. The next one says, Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. We'll talk about that in here in just a minute. And that he, God, rewards those who sincerely seek him. I love the English Standard Version. The ESV says this. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The New Revised Standard Version says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would approach him must believe that he exists. Lee Strobel said this, If Jesus is the Son of God, his teachings are more than just good ideas from, wise, from a wise teacher. They are divine insights on which I can confidently build my life. So let's look at that Hebrews chapter 11 passage a little deeper. It says, Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. Now, this seems to be a given, right? That anyone who believes, anyone who's following Jesus, anyone who, who does that should believe that God exists. And you, you would think that if you believed God exists, then that would cause you to do certain things and cause you not to do other things. 
then why does the writer of Hebrews mention, why isn't it just a given? Why does he mention it? Shouldn't this just be the starting point for everyone following Jesus? I would think so. So there must be more here than, than simply just believing that God is God. Is there? Is there more than belief? Is there a different kind of belief? James 2 gives us some insight into that. James 2, verse 19, you say you have faith, all right? For you believe there is one God. James is talking to this hypothetical Christian, this, this person who's following Christ. You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. So James articulates, you believe there's one God, and you have belief in that God. You have faith. James says, good for you. Even the demons believe this. Uh-oh. Now I'm stuck. James has just said that I believe there is one God, and now I'm in the same ballpark as demons who tremble in terror because they know there's one God. But yet, James says, okay, how foolish. How foolish are you? Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? James has now just taken simple faith and tied it with life, with action, with good deeds. And we're not saying here, and I don't, think, believe, I don't believe James is saying here either, that good deeds get you to heaven. That's not what he says. He's making the point. You say you have faith. You believe in God, right? Sure, yes, I do. Well, even the demons do that. Don't you realize that if you truly have faith, belief in God, then that belief in God's going to change the way you live life. It's going to change the things that you do. It's just can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? He says, don't you remember? He gives us a, a story, don't you, an illustration. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God, verse 21, by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Verse 22, you see, his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called a friend of God. So James concludes, so you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. There is this element that comes out of a transformed life. Jesus speaks of fruit. Other New Testament writers speak of, I'll know you by your fruit. I'll know you by this, right? I'll know, I'll know you not just by the fact that you believe in God, but I'll know you by how your faith changes your life. Go back to that verse 23 for just a minute. Did you catch it? There's a very important phrase, and it's very, mm, we miss it often. Abraham believed God. It doesn't say that Abraham believed in God. You see, Abraham's faith was that he believed God. He took God at his word. He didn't just believe in God. Yes, God, I believe in you. No, no, no. Abraham believed God. He believed God was going to do what God was going to do. He, he believed God when he said something. He believed him. And not just believe in, but believed him. Trust, hope. These are the things that, that come out of that. Abraham's faith, his belief in God, he believed God, he took him at his word, caused him to make certain decisions. His faith caused him to change his way of thinking, his, his way of treating other people. 
Abraham was willing to do whatever it took to please God, even to the point of offering his son as a sacrifice. Now, we know God provided for a way out. The Bible makes it clear that God always provides a way out. The point to this entire story here in Hebrews, I, I believe, helps us understand what it means to live near God, to pursue God. This is different than just believing in God. I can believe in God and never really change anything. I can believe that God is who he says he is. I can believe that. I can believe that God even created the world. I can believe in that. But if I don't believe God, take him at his word, then I may never change anything about my life. My faith doesn't impact my actions. And James says that kind of faith is useless. New Testament scholar, theologian said this about this whole Hebrew section. It's F.F. Bruce and he says this about faith that makes a difference. He says, the next example of faith illustrates this willingness to believe that what God has promised, he will certainly perform. And he's talking about this section of Hebrews 11. First talks about Abraham, then it talks about Noah. And in between is our scripture verse for today. Noah was a righteous man. Like Abel, he walked with God, as did Enoch. But what is emphasized in Noah's story is that it's when God announced that he would do something that has never been seen before. In Noah's experience and, and, and with everyone else, Noah did something. He took him at his word. When God said he was going to do something that no one had ever seen before, that no one had ever heard before, Noah didn't question it. Noah believed God. He didn't just believe in God. He was like, okay, God, yeah, okay, whatever. No, he believed God. And that belief made a practical difference in his life. Bruce says, Noah took him at his word, and he showed that he did this by making practical preparations against the day when that word would come true. Noah didn't know when that truth would play out. He just believed that it would. See, this is the tricky part. This is the part that we sometimes get lost in. Are we making preparations against the day when God will make his promise true? Or are we just doing what everybody else did in Noah's day, going about our business, doing life, and not preparing? I'll be honest, there are days that, man, I don't feel like I've prepared much. I haven't studied much. I haven't spent much time with God. I just get up in the morning, get to work, and go through the stuff and huh, worry about what somebody's going to say, worry about a phone call, um, pray for somebody, and, and I do the job. And a few days of that, back to back to back, I find myself just tired and empty. And then I realize, oh, I haven't spent much time with you, God. I've studied your word. I've, I've read stuff. I've wrote stuff down. I've written sermons. I've prepared. I've prayed with people. I've done that. But I, I haven't just really sat in your lap. I haven't really just enjoyed you. I haven't really spent much time with you. I've done a lot of your things, but I haven't sincerely sought you out. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It's impossible to please God without faith. We've already established the connection with faith and action. Anyone who wants to come to him must, one, believe that God exists. That's what we just talked about. Believe God. Believe that he exists. Believe who he is. And that that God rewards those who sincerely seek him. To live a blessed life, to live this best life possible, 
I not only have to believe God, I not only have to make preparations to to do what he says, but I have to every day pursue him, to seek him desperately. And when I do that, he rewards me. He rewards me with the things that I need, joy and patience, kindness, goodness, love. He doesn't reward me with a bunch of earthly things that are going to disappear. Now, he might. Wealth, he might decide to bless me with wealth. But he already knows that if he blesses me with wealth, I'm going to turn around and use it for the kingdom because I've already proven myself in the little things. Remember what we talked about last week? You see, both participles in this Hebrews 11, both participles in the Greek is the one who comes and the one who sincerely or earnestly seeks. Both the one who comes and the one who seeks. In the Greek, they are present tenses, which means they have a continual action. It's not a one-time belief. It's not a one-time action. It's not a one-time prayer. It's not a one-time seeking out God. It is a continual action. Faith, biblical faith, causes me to seek out God continually. And when I continually believe, no matter what circumstance, that God is who God is, and I continually seek him out, then God rewards me. It doesn't say how he rewards me. It just says he does. James Girdwood says, one must keep coming, seeking God as a lifestyle. One must keep seeking as a regular, habitual, predominant way of life. I love what he says. A single cry never indicates the real nature of the heart. A perpetual cry does. One seeking moment doesn't point to a life of deep faith. Now understand me. I want the best life possible. I want what God, I want everything that God has planned for me. I want to, I want to live life to the fullest. I want to experience God at his deepest level. And if I'm going to do that, then it can't just be this one cry, this one thing. It has to be an overflow of something. It has to be an overflow of a lifestyle. What lifestyle? What? What helps me get into this fullness of life? Simply put, this is where faith bridges into worship. This is what the psalmist says is important. This is where our faith, trust, and hope, this is where it bridges over into not just believing in God, but believing God, and that belief turns into worship. It turns into praise because, one, we know God exists. We know God created, God did. We know all of what God has already done, and we believe and hope and strain forward to what God is going to do. And we earnestly seek him daily. See, Hebrews chapter 4, if, if we go back to some key passages in Hebrews leading up to Hebrews 11, we look at Hebrews 4 and it says, So let us come boldly into the throne of our gracious God. There will we receive his mercy, and, he will find, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. When I believe in Jesus, when I come to Jesus, I believe Jesus. I believe God's word. I take him at his word, and I can come boldly to him. Hebrews chapter 7, once and forever to save those who come to God through him, he is able. Jesus lives forever to intercede with God on my behalf. I know Jesus is there interceding for me. 
So I don't have to worry about standing distantly from God. I can confidently and earnestly seek him out. And right before chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews says, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. This, my friends, is where this discipline of pursuit is so important. Harry Emerson Fosdick said, the steady discipline of intimate friendship with Jesus results in men becoming like him. I gave you a lot of stuff. And you're probably scratching your head going, I don't understand how it all fits together. Well, simply put, this is the point for me. This is it for me. This is how I remember it. The more my faith is transformed into godly action, then the more I become like Jesus. And every day I want to become more like Jesus than I was today. And when I fail, I don't need to shy back. I don't need to escape. I don't need to run in fear. I believe God. And I believe when I come to him for forgiveness, he will forgive me. That's what he says. So I don't have to stand at a distance. I can trust him. And the more I understand that, the more I can worship him and truly love him. I'm not talking about an hour on Sunday. I'm talking about spending time with God daily. Because you want to. Because you know who he is. You know how good he is. You know what he does for your life. And I believe in him. I believe him. And I earnestly seek him. And I know that he rewards me. He rewards me with joy, with goodness, faithfulness, self-control, with love, forgiveness. He rewards me, he rewards me with providing for my needs, blessing me abundantly. Scriptures make it clear I can't fathom his goodness. I can't fathom how much he wants to bless me. Time spent in God's presence is never wasted. And the more I spend in his presence, the more I'm transformed. The more my mind is transformed, the more my heart is transformed, and the more I can better worship him. I don't have to worry about what song it is. I don't have to worry about what genre it is. I don't have to worry about if it's a hymn or a new song or an old song or a kid's song. I just spent a week at Wonder Valley, at Grace Week, with kids and adults with disabilities all over the chart. And we sang kids' songs. We sang old songs. We sang songs out of tune. I even blared a song from my truck. Didn't matter. All that matters was that we were there with God. And God showed up. And it was good. And people were happy. People were clapping their hands. It was honest. It was real. It wasn't a performance. There's a difference. There's a difference in your life when you believe God and you earnestly seek him daily. The psalmist concludes, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God to my last breath. May all my thoughts be pleasing to him for I rejoice in the Lord. Why was the psalmist willing to praise God to their last breath? Why was the psalmist willing to yield every thought to God? Why was the psalmist willing to sing to God as long as they lived? It was because they rejoiced in the Lord. How do I get to that rejoicing point? 
part. I start with faith. And every day, I take that faith and I turn it into godly action. And the more that I act like Jesus, the more that I spend time with God, the more that I am with him, the Holy Spirit then transforms me. It transforms my mind and my heart. And I'm able to worship as an overflow. And it becomes real. Paul tells Timothy, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. I believe that today. And I believe God. And I trust his word. And I know that everyone has a chance to repent. And I hate the things that God hates. And I love the things that God loves. And so every day I do what Jesus calls me to do. If any of you wants to be my follower, Give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Tim Keller, I'll conclude with this thought. As many have learned and later taught, you don't realize Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all that you have. As we take communion today, as we close this out in just a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. But as we move into that time, I want you to think of this story. It's a folk story from South India. There was a little boy, and he loved to play marbles. And he had this favorite marble, a blue marble. And he kept it in his pocket with all of his other marbles. And one day he was walking through the village trying to find someone to play marbles with. And he noticed a a girl sitting by herself eating some chocolate. Now, there's one thing more in life that he loved more than marbles was chocolate. He loved chocolate. And the more he thought about it, the more he felt his mouth water and his belly grumble. And the more that he watched this little girl eat this candy this uncontrollable thought come over him. I have to get my hands on this chocolate. So concocting a plan, he walked over to the little girl and he said, I have a deal to make with you. I'll give you all my marbles for all of your chocolate. And the little girl thought it was a good deal. So the little boy reached into his pocket And he felt for that blue marble. And he pushed that blue marble aside and pulled out all the other marbles, keeping the blue marble in his pocket. He handed the marbles over and he received the chocolate from the girl, all the candy. And as he walked away, he turned back to the little girl. And he said, did you give me all of the chocolates? Or are you holding some back? There the story ends. But there is the lesson. You and I do this all the time. We want everything from the kingdom of God. We want to have a secure sense of our eternity. We want all of our prayers answered. We want to feel close to God, feel close to Jesus. We want Jesus to be our friend. We want to flourish in all of God's blessing and riches. We want it all. But 
we are often, if not always, unwilling to give up our blue marble. The one thing in our life that we believe gives us the most joy. So today as we take communion, I got to ask, what's your blue marble look like? What in your life are you holding on to? What have you kept in your pocket just for you? What have you not turned over to God yet? Gather your communion. We'll give you time and pause. But truly today as you go before the the God of all creation, one who wants to reward you, wants to guide you, the one who wants to give you everything. Just seek in your heart today. Am I holding on to my blue marble? Am I truly earnestly, continually seeking to spend time with him daily? Or am I just doing it as I need it? It's a hard question. It's not an easy one to think about. But if you want true, honest, wholesome worship, real worship without worrying about anything else, then you'll realize that there's only one thing in this world that you truly need. And that is Jesus. If you don't know him, I'd love to tell you more about him. If you want to reach out to us, we'd love to talk to you about it. No matter what you do today, I hope that you will look into your heart, try to find that blue marble, and finally today, let God have it. Thanks for being here. Let's take communion together now. great to be with you today. I hope that something um, that you heard today was encouraging to you, uplifting to you, and uh, we want you to know that we'd love to help you take your next step in following Jesus. Um, So whatever that looks like for you, we're here for you, and you can uh, leave a comment there in that chat, or you can go over to our website at scottsburg.church, fill out that online connect card, um, and we'll be right there with you to walk with you. Uh, We're here today uh, at church, and uh, here in our worship center and know that we would love uh, to meet you in person sometime. We've got services every Sunday at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 right here in this room. Um, and it would be a great privilege to worship alongside of you here in person. So uh, you're welcome to be here with us one day. But thanks for joining us online. Uh, we love you. We can't wait to see you back next week. Have a great day and a great week.